you know, for all those people who are on the call, you must be wondering uh, what is that we are going to cover. Your last 30 days or 45 days, every day, every minute, you have been hearing um, about COVID um, and coronavirus and uh, what are the symptoms, what precautions to take. And uh, you've been following the guidelines of the uh, government. Um, uh, you are seeing the announcements of lockdown. Um, you've seen our whole world has changed uh, in the last few weeks. And uh, you've spent most of the last few weeks time on this subject. So what we are going to do, how are we going to make uh, this next 45 minutes or so different from uh, what you've seen or heard. Yes, we all know the symptoms. Uh, we all know that uh, it's for real. We are seeing um, uh, yeah, the wishful thinking in the beginning that the beginning of this crisis that we had that yes, it is uh, uh, only restricted to China and um, we are we may not be affected by it like the way that Ebola happened or SARS happened um, that is gone now now corona is uh, spread all over the world and um, the most advanced countries are the most hit unfortunately because they are the most connected with the rest of the world and uh, we are seeing thousands of people, over 300,000 people affected, over 13,000 people have died. And um, every expert is predicting that this is going to um, be, um, this is going to run into millions and it is here to stay for the next few weeks or months or even um, more than a year to come. Now, our session will focus on um, one critical aspect while COVID is here to stay how are we going to deal with it how are we going to run our business how are we going to make sure that our employees are safe how are we going to make sure that our families are safe our uh, children and our, our parents are going to be safe how do we survive the coronavirus and for those most of you are entrepreneurs who have logged in today um, the I know that many of your businesses may not be able to function with the with the corona um, COVID uh, being around uh, the doctors here are going to give us expert opinion on how do we um, how do we survive so when I was speaking to Gopi and Ramesh um, the uh, you know, an interesting um, question uh, emerged. How are they keeping their hospitals safe for their employees? They are, they are working overnight. How are they keeping themselves safe from this, um, uh, from, from this danger of contracting? You know, I believe that's a big example for all of us uh, in terms of, um, in a similar manner, uh, if we can run our offices and businesses, I think we will all be uh, at least um, uh, will not be fatally hit as uh, the rest of the industry is going to be. Over to you, Gopi. Uh, Ramesh, I see you set now. Um, I, I, once again, I appreciate um, your, um, your, your, both of your time. Uh, we know that how precious it is. And we really appreciate on behalf of Thai uh, and uh, CEO clubs, uh, we welcome you to the session with a focus on how do we be safe, survive, and um, continue to run our life. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for the. Can you reduce your volume, please, uh, Sridhar? Yeah. Okay. So uh, basically, that's a, a great uh, introduction uh, to the disease. Um, all the uh, callers in, um, hello, and uh, wish you uh, a best of luck in this uh, troubled and trying times. Um, basically, as you all, um, I'm sure, are aware about uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, or the SARS-CoV-2, uh, 
um, has been around in the middle of uh, January, and it's more so uh, for late February and uh, this month, this has become a pandemic. Now, there are a lot of lessons learned from uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, South Korea um, about the, at least, uh, what we can call it as preventive measures. Uh, Sridhar uh, raised a pertinent question about within the healthcare facilities, how are we preventing the uh, spread of the disease? Now, as far as we are concerned, we should say every person either is a vector, vector means a transmitter of the disease, or a possible victim of receiving the virus. These are the only two ways you can say ben. or at least understand the, um, the enormity or, or the depth of the danger that uh, every one of us are in. Luckily, in health sector or health care facility, we already have uh, practices of uh, cross-infection prevention. We have infectious disease committees in each hospitals. Uh, we have practices of uh, hand wash, hand rub, which is actually uh, uh, training goes on uh, every week or every month, depends on the hospital, to reiterate the um, hand wash uh to make sure that there is a cross uh, infection now we um, so we have doubled that we are uh, constantly at a vigil to make sure people uh, follow uh, the hand rub and now over and above that uh, we make sure all the uh, personnel are given uh, masks because as you know uh, recently a new england journal there is a publication about how long the virus lasts as an aerosol around the surface of the copper, cardboard, plastic, and so on and so forth. And there is a recent WhatsApp group uh, saying that uh, it lasts in the air much, much longer. It's transmitted through air. So mask will become a necessity uh, in every uh, place, either healthcare facility or industry, such as manufacturing industry, I guess service industries can probably do from home, like uh, software. Uh, so uh, while maintaining the uh, social uh, distance, you also need to uh, make sure that you wear a mask so that your uh, particles, the uh, 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 saliva particles which carries highly infectious virus doesn't get across, or you also don't receive from others by maintaining the uh, social distance. Uh, some people call it six feet, some people call it three meters. It just depends on how, what is feasible in your own facility. Uh, second thing, most important thing is people are complacent, not understanding the, the depths of the, uh, uh, the risk that each of us are in. Uh, as I said, either you can infect people or you receive infection. So, this need to be constantly drilled into people's mind uh, every hour, every two hours, every three hours uh, in a day so that until people will become aware and the complacency comes down. And certainly anybody coming in, in our hospital, for instance, I'm sure Ramesh will confirm this, we have people standing just at one entry, single entry point, or two entry points, both places, we have a security person, we have a healthcare personnel checking the temperature, and there is a, a, a executive asking questions like, you have fever, you have a cold, you have upper respiratory tract uh, issues, have you been traveling, or have you come across or in, came in contact with people who have traveled and came back to see you? So all these questions, it, it doesn't take more than one or two minutes to uh, do all this, so that at least we prevent people coming in or we can at least take uh, segregate people who are potentials who have already uh, a suspect or definitely a person who has uh, a disease so if you segregate these three segments so you can handle the uh, volumes of your uh, personnel better this could be from ceo down to uh, cleaner everybody need to be taken care i believe these are the preventive steps mask hand wash and social distance are the three fundamental things hopefully 
would break this chain of transmission. I guess uh, that's the only thing that we can do. We don't have a treatment or vaccine as of now. There are lots of uh, uh, messages and information floating around in the social medias about uh, some of the drugs like uh, hydroxychloroquine and all those things. But they're only observational and very small group of people that tried. So try and tr prevent the transmission and contracting the disease. That's the only way to break the uh, the, the transmission, the, the pandemic, in my view. Ramesh. Yeah, I think uh, there's, uh, uh, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Bokshin. The, the, I'm a pediatrician. The, from our perspective, actually, uh, I mean, many of your young uh, parents, uh, this is not a serious disease. Generally, uh, viral infections are always more serious in children than adults, but fortunately, this is one thing which is uh, not a, uh, to be very very serious on children but however the transmission rate is very very high children are actually a great transmitters that's why very very important to segregate children from the older people you know i um, mean uh, 60 70 years plus people because we can't really implement uh, stringent uh, the uh, social distance masks all those things with children that's very very important the I mean, we've been talking to people across uh, in uh, Italy and Spain and uh, UK and US, and uh, there are very few children actually being so very sick, like adults. So that's really a, a reassuring good news from the children's point of view. We just need to be taking care of them, you know, isolating from the uh, the older older people in, at homes. The you know, I, this is something probably first time we are encountering. Uh, probably people who are in uh, uh, the South Asian countries, they have, they have gone through the SARS, a very similar situation. So, which is why one of the reasons they were kind of able to, they, their ability to contain this uh, was very efficient compared to the, uh, Europe and uh, America and, and, and also us. The, See, by and large, this infection is not going to leave us. This is going to infect the uh, vast majority of people. By by end of the year, most of us are infected somewhere or other, and we all develop in her immunity, and uh, there, therefore it becomes uh, like another viral infections. The concern why we are all panicked now is because of uh, is a infection, infectiousness and uh, uh, the rate of infection, the rate of growth of this uh, 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 spread of virus. That's a, uh, that's a reason why we are so worried about it because the sickness all, uh, the year-long sickness comes together like rain, year-long rain comes in one day or two days, That like Mumbai, it gets completely choked. The same thing, you know, the whole healthcare systems are getting choked because of the illness is coming um, uh, together, I mean, uh, the massively and the whole community is falling sick. That's what is what we have been seeing in uh, uh, in Italy, Spain, and uh, now currently in America. So people have actually been, uh, we have perfect examples, uh, Southeast Asian countries versus uh, the European countries. Mm -hmm. The Southeast Asian countries, they have, they have actually gone through some of the the uh, epidemics earlier. They, have, they managed very well. Uh, and uh, this is something um, uh, which uh, they have managed extremely effective. And uh, compared to the Europe, uh, compared to the Italy, European countries, and America to now, within, within America also, you see that uh, California has handled much effectively than uh, than in New York and Washington. So clearly, it shows that you know the people who have actually handled the social distance and are locking down the cities are definitely proven to be effective. But that there only seems to be a is a more of an epidemiological problem. It's a it's a and this battle has to be done out of the hospital. It is not the battle to be done in the hospital. So, so the the battle has gone to hospital. Where in Italy, that's why they're struggling because there are too many patients, too much, uh, too uh, the less of infrastructure. Then, for for sure, the no city in the world is able is uh, will be able to you know deal with it when the massively whole community becomes sick. And that kind of load, no one can take it up. The America can't take it up. So, so that's why we're concerned in this country, worried about it. Quite uh, quite rightly, our government has taken the steps and uh, locking down. I think we need to be a very cooperative of people like us because we are all running businesses. For example, 
uh, we run a children's hospital. So we have a little different uh, children and maternity. We have a different, little, slightly different situation because we can't completely lock down as a hospital. We have to run essential services, emergency services, and we need to be prepared for a COVID outbreak as well. This is what we have been working on last one week time. Now, how do we actually run the essential services? So what we are trying to do is we just kind of chopped out the uh, plan. So one is that, you know, telephone advice. People can call us. We are actually populating uh, to the, our call center to say that people can call us for advice. Do I need to come into hospital or not? Don't need to come into hospital. That's one way of we, we can actually we, we reassure them whether to come in or not. So people who need to come in, we get them to into the hospital. The second we are actually initiating is the online consultations, which, which is going to happen from Wednesday. So the people who need to come, either they come through the, to the hospital doorstep or, or within the, to, into the hospital or come on the online and then do the consultation. That's something we're working on that. And also we segregated the beds and isolation wards and everything, and also including our patients for the people who whoever have got a viral illness. So we can't differentiate who is COVID, who is non-COVID. There's always about in children, the 30% of them are actually a viral infections, uh, a breast infection. So all of them are going to go and get examined separately based on their history and symptoms and uh, the chest findings. We uh, we order, we ask for the tests and those things. So coming to the women who are actually we are we literally calling every single antenatal woman whoever is at home and saying that absolutely go into self quarantine and uh, take care of yourself. If you do need to chat with us, please do call us. We'll come and discuss with you. And if you have to come in for some electro things, so we can postpone it. Some of the scans which are critical, which need to be uh, like anomaly scans and those things, we can't uh, postpone too long. So they are going to come in and uh, at a specific time to get the scans done. And uh, deliveries as usual, it happens. And uh, people who are suspect to have some upper respiratory infections, we have segregated a yeah, separate uh, area of the delivery room and uh, theaters for them separately. Even if they're kind of somebody's infected, we are ready and prepared for that. So we can prepare for uh, the small numbers, but we can't prepare for the very large numbers. This is what the problem of today is, which is why this uh, social distancing and uh, uh, personal hygiene, taking care of uh, ourselves and uh, uh, the social measures are so important for us. And um, when it comes to the how, so for example, if we go in a week or two weeks time, we need to get into the uh, situation of uh, uh, treating a lot of patients like Europe. Uh, we have a secondary plan of one of the hospitals, of, uh, we have six hospitals. One of the hospitals, we may make it completely a, a coronavirus hospital and then take care of all the patients, whether children or maternity in those in the hospital, the rest of the hospital run as a uh, essential service hospital. This is, uh, we have been discussing, I think other day, Sridhar and myself were discussing about uh, essential service like a, you know, dead center. So how do you do it? Because um, all our data is there, dead center. So we need data all the time. So our call center doesn't work without without controllers. So we are so interlinked. So if, if, they, if, they, if, they, if they, sh they, they break down, then we are completely broken down. So. There are so much of linkages to the technology and uh, so much of linkages to the call centers and also other you know infrastructures because they are equally efficient, uh, equally important for us to function normally. So uh, in th those situations also, I think you need to have the teams to support. I think probably we are not come to the stage yet. I think uh, in uh, if we are moving into the stage of. Uh, 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 um, the massive transmission of a disease and also more sicker patients coming in there. So even the essential services like uh, some of the essential IT services and companies and uh, need to have their own backup plan of, uh, seg uh, of uh, different teams working in the different times, maybe quarantining them differently or putting them in a separate place to come back to work. Damages are going to be important. Yeah. Shridhar, oh. anything? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Is this better voice, uh, Gopi? Yes, yeah, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Now, now, work from home has become a reality 
for most of the IT industry. They're able to do it. Um, for those industries um, who are into, let's say, manufacturing or any other critical uh, situation where they cannot, um, uh, they, they cannot afford to stay home. Uh, for example, we are building new data centers uh, in Bombay, and uh, we cannot stop the project in between. Now, uh, while our own project staff is there, contractors, their staff are coming, these could run into a few hundred people. Now, how do we um, take some measures? Yes, we are taking temperature controls, we are taking, uh, we are giving them masks, uh, and some of the staff we are giving, uh, you know, um, are there any ways to detect uh, quicker? Are there any tests which have become operational? Or is, are there any better precautions that we could take up uh, to make these kind of activities function? Even at not full speed, at uh, let's say one third speed. Yeah. See there, first of all, uh, as much as possible, I know it's a business, uh, you stand to lose, uh, you know, <laughs> dollars, billions, or millions, whatever it is. But I, I'm, I, guess, I, I took I took example of uh, control S, but uh, yeah, yeah, there are many sure critical industries. Let's yeah, let's sure. imagine a manufacturing company which is making medical equipment. Let's say. Yeah. Uh, medical equipment, essential uh, manufacturing services like pharma industry, medical uh, disposable industry. You can't stop. You have to go on full because there is much more. Uh, pressure on them to uh, turn out more and more material and uh, medicines. Now, as, as you know, as we are facing pandemic and there is no medicine or vaccine to prevent this, and there is a certain amount of attrition in people who acquire this disease, um, and also not enough medical services to take care of the the projected number of uh, sick people that are going to come up in the next by July. Some people predicted that uh, half the Indian population are going to be positive. Whether they need entire uh, medical help or not, at least two, three million people may be in need of uh, hospitalization or some sort of a oxygen from oxygenation, giving two or three liters of oxygen to as much as uh, ventilation. So the problem could be potentially enormous and overwhelming for any one country, not just India, anyway. I mean, uh, even the U.S. and uh, U.K. also are running out of uh, 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 equipment and uh, services uh, uh, that need to uh, address these patients. So it's important that at all costs we should prevent congregation. That is, workers, if you can afford, I suppose you can take some hit and still contribute to the betterment of the society, um, at least in the next one month. If we can either reduce or even stop uh, your uh, non-essential constructions, manufacturing, um, any other thing which not which are, which are not directly connected with helping the betterment of COVID-19 would be a great help to the society. Because if you bring in 100 people to your work site and those 100 people contract or at least 10 people contract, and you can say every one person, three people gets infected, and then you can imagine the map. You can do the uh, arithmetics to understand what it is like. Uh, so that is fundamental. But as Ramesh said, some of the um, some of the places where you you do need to run the industry for the help of the uh, the, the uh, pandemic. Uh, certainly, so as we already pointed out, social distancing, mask, hand 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 wash, and also necessary gloves um, and more importantly the surfaces they need to be cleaned time and time and again and day steel card cardboards cardboards are coming in with like amazon's coming in with boxes they need to be uh, left outside and uh, make sure that um, those are uh, taken care of properly disposed of um, a lot of people who are daycare earners day day wage earners are also need to be addressed and I'm sure all of us, like in the hospitals, for instance, housekeeping uh, staff are all um, uh, day uh, wage earners. They need, if they don't work, they don't have food. So we ha somehow need to take care of them and maybe uh, bring them in batches. I mean, if you tone down or if you uh, scale down your uh, industry 
both in service industry as well as uh, manufacturing industry you can certainly bring down the number of people coming in uh, into the into the workplace at any given day and there are several uh, uh, ways you can reduce them you can bring them in keep them in give them accommodation food and shelter and uh, clothes uh, either for a week or two weeks and then swap them for uh, new people or you can whatever works for you every two days you can uh, change the uh, staff so that the number of people coming in uh, will be less and then you can easy it's easy to maintain the uh, personal hygiene social distancing and all those things so the chances of transmission becomes uh, minimal or at least uh, contained to a certain extent we can't uh, hope for completely stop the transmission and uh, uh, salaries obviously they need to get full salaries and this is also an impact for all businesses uh, they should get their salaries so that they don't worry about if I don't work i don't get food or anything and they may indulge going out and uh, working somewhere else and contract in the disease and then they come to the workplace and then transmit that disease to others so these are um, you know much more detailed uh, way of doing uh, things just like what we have as a committee to, to combat uh, uh, COVID-19 each of you who are running industries or service uh, sectors should have a core committee of uh, four or five people who can cons constantly consolidate the information and the knowledge that's coming in every day and also oversee the implementation of all these good practices in each of your uh, facility so that you are contributing to the uh, prevention of transmission this is also very important i don't know whether you have a committee if you don't you should have a committee the ceo hr and uh, uh, any other uh, facility managers uh, to make sure that they not only equipped with uh, the right knowledge and uh, 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 material that is needed uh, and also make sure that it is audited whether they are being practiced or not these are some of the good things that one should uh, know one should have as practices to make sure that you contribute to the prevention of the disease Ramesh yes <clears throat> well I think uh, see one thing is that now this is a pose uh, generally what we see is now the lot of calls we keep getting from the uh, the families and uh, some of the friends, patients. See, the everyone is kind of uh, uh, asking us, okay, do you think uh, we should all get tested? And um, it's better to know whether we have it or not. So it doesn't matter how much it costs. A lot of questions are going around now. So I don't think anyone needs to go to get a test done if it's positive or not. So eventually whether we don't whether we want it or we don't want it to come by, by any December. that's a that's for sure see, what is required not is not panic actually well you see it's a panic situation which is uh, what is prevailing across the world and it's not i would not put it as a panic situation i think it's concerning it's a great concern but there are a lot of uh, addressable this concern can be addressed the addressable concern but it's not going to take away wipe out uh, 30% of the world's population or 50% of the world's population. It, if we are not careful, it may maximum take away 5% of the, uh, the, you know, in the entire, entire uh, you know, epicenter areas. So not more than that. So therefore, it is uh, the concern which should make us become more aware and uh, um, we actually make sure that uh, more socialistic in terms of uh, taking responsibility and we ourselves follow and make everyone, every, everybody else. We have one problem now in hospitals. People come and uh, uh, they don't disclose the necessary information. They only disclose and halfway through the consultation or at the end of the consultation. Anyway, we are, we, we are come, we just come from uh, Italy or we come from Spain. So that makes people worry about it. So initially in uh, disclosure form, they don't, they're not disclosing it. So this is our biggest concern. The, the, the hostility is something. See, the hostility, again, when you look at it, because I may not be seen, I may be thrown out. That may be the reason they are saying that. So I think if we reduce the panic, 
panic mess and make uh, aware of people, educate people and say that if we take care of, we'll be fine, we are secured. And also we got an example. We got a great example in front of us, in front of us how uh, uh, Japan did it, how uh, South Korea did it, how Singapore has done it. We just need to be uh, self-aware and then also listen to the uh, government, what are the regulatory side and try and see that uh, optimize our mini I think minimalize our business side, try and see that you know essential services to go on and run. Um, maybe we can come back into business very quickly. So that is probably right, right way of looking at we as a businessman. For, for two weeks of lockdown, definitely is going to uh, reduce the, if not flatten, it will definitely reduce the height of the car. So then people will be comfortable. They know that you now. A lot of people have got infection, they take out, and then few, very few are actually uh, going to hospitals. This is what happened with swine flu three years, four years ago. We don't get scared of swine flu anymore because we know the natural history of swine flu. We know who gets sicker and how we treat it, what is the mortality, everything else. This is something which we don't know yet, the uh, whole picture of uh, um, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. So by December, January, this would become another virus, actually. The only worry is that, you know, as a medical person, it is, this virus is a lot more virulent than, uh, uh, than other viruses, what we have seen. And uh, if this actually takes, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, mutations, if there's going to be a mutation, how severe are the, are the new mutations are going to be? That's something in the back of the mind is a worry, but I think, you know, what is what is there in front of us, in front of us we have to deal with that. So we know the, we know the magnitude and uh, seeing other countries and in our country at, at the moment, one reassuring thing is we, we all know that the, the, it's not 350 cases. There may be a 35,000 cases, so there may be 350,000 cases in India. We all know that because we're only testing only a, people have come back from the other countries but but at the same time we know that the sickness because of coronavirus is not there much in india if uh, sickness is already there i mean we've been constantly checking with uh, uh, other cities uh, what is happening in bangalore what is happening in mumbai and delhi so that's where the where a lot of, quite a few patients are there none of them are actually uh, 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 cities have got a significant number of patients which are more than normal with a severe respiratory distress syndrome, distress conditions are being ventilated, or our ICUs are full with those respiratory infections. That's reassuring. Suppose if you say that Mumbai has got a, uh, Mumbai has 35,000 cases, not many are there in intensive care units. That's probably reassuring because we, this is a country where we always get exposed to many, many viruses all the times. There's something are uh, endemic going on, so maybe we may be a more, more uh, you know, the immunologically more tolerant to the infections. We don't know yet, but definitely in this country, as on today, uh, as on the summer, there are not many people who are present to the ICUs with a severe respiratory distress or syndromes or needing ventilation, which is, I think, uh, something reassuring for everyone, you know, who's on the platform now. Very good news, <laughs> considering the current situation. I mean, uh, yeah. look at Italy, uh, more than, I think, 4 5% uh, of, the, of the death rate. Um, whereas when I see the report from India, uh, hardly anyone is in ICU. There are a few in the hospital, but hardly anyone is in ICU. Right? So this, uh, uh, this is, uh, yeah, copy. Uh, Why um, is this? Sir, the, pro the issue is that there is a spectrum of uh, COVID-19 uh, according to some uh, studies there are seven different types three of them are of low virulence and another four of them are uh, high virulence so if you take American uh, say for instance uh, Washington uh, death rate Italian death rate and all those things they have a much higher death rate are affected population compared to China and uh, Singapore and other places even in India for instance uh, that could be one of the reasons why, uh, depending on the virulence of the strain, uh, you have a higher mortality, higher sick people, higher number of sick people who needs uh, much more 
uh, medical input than uh, what we are seeing in India. The other could be that in India we are already exposed to lots and lots of infections, either in the air, uh, fecal oral route, food, whatever it is. So naturally there may be certain immunity. All these things are currently speculation. But uh, good news is that uh, we are not as sick as uh, the Western population. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I have got a question from um, one of the uh, person attending uh, this. I have a, I have teenagers and my mom is 79. If my child shows symptoms, what should I do to the rest? If I show symptoms, what should the rest do? If my mom shows symptoms, what should I do to the children? Okay, any one person uh, in the in the family who has symptoms, first thing is to make sure others are protected. You either isolate yourself or you get out of the house and get the uh, swabs taken if you have the right kind of symptoms to first of all prove whether you have COVID-19 or not. Uh, but most importantly, to, to uh, get everybody to wear masks, isolate yourself, and also uh, themselves uh, as much as possible maintain social uh, uh, distance all those things within the house and uh, somebody actually sent a very nice video if you have suspected uh, covid 19 you go into your room even the food is delivered to the t uh, to the door and you take it in and then when it comes out it gets cleaned and your your clothes are are put in double bags you know your bin liner you have to have two bin liners uh, where you put your clothes in and then they are separately washed uh, so that that, the, that doesn't get uh, transmitted i would also urge uh, the mother needs a lot more attention because of the age uh, uh, maybe they have comorbid conditions like uh, hypertension diabetes as well as a heart condition so uh, she needs much more care in fact social distancing uh, of her as a, a self quarantine leaving her food in her room and that kind of thing also should help and make sure that uh, she doesn't interact with especially maids for old people we we tend to put one or two maids helping them going into the bathroom or giving them whatever the so those maids also need to be um, uh, uh, protecting themselves like with masks and washing their hands and all those things are very very important uh, to make sure that we protect teenagers even if I'm in rubbish you can address this but the point is teenagers even if they become positive currently the uh, the risk rate very very low um, between nine years and 49 years the uh, the serious infections which also can lead to death is 0.3%. And immediately uh, beyond, beyond 50, it uh, jumps to 1.3%. So um, you should not be worried too much about uh, teenagers. I would be much more uh, worried about the mother uh, who is 79. Ramesh. Yeah, and I think, you know, the uh, uh, children and uh, up to 18 years time, uh, I mean, up to 12 years time, and extremely low risk in this one. It's a simple you know, viral cold, a common cold, what it calls. It's a kind of uh, experience um, right from China to Italy to America. This is what they've been witnessing. So because we've been acquiring uh, constantly with all the colleagues uh, and uh, various people. The, the, some of these, uh, the, uh, the few, some disturbing news coming from uh, America, especially Washington, Seattle, and the area, uh, quite a few younger patients are actually those who are about uh, 20 years to 49. In ICUs, people getting at ICUs are actually uh, about 37% uh, uh, being uh, in that age group. And uh, we don't know why they are actually becoming sicker. Maybe they are displaying a different immunological uh, uh, reaction to the virus. So they're getting into the ICU, the lungs are becoming are going to the uh, ARDS and becoming very difficult to ventilate. So that's what I think uh, some of the intensive care personnel, people who have been working in Seattle and other new Montana industry, they, they, have, they have been expressing. And it's come in the news as well that uh, 
percentage of the people, the younger, less than 50 year old, have been little higher on the Washington and New York trade. We don't know yet, we don't know what percentage is from Italy, but uh, they are saying mostly from uh, old age group people. But the that's why the in America, uh, the not, not only in America, um, it, once uh, we have not come to that stage yet. So we have been constantly discussing about, uh, should we take uh, the, some prophylaxis medication? Are there any medications or not? Definitely there's no definitive medications, which have been kind of a, FDA approved or anything like that, but there are uh, the the fairly good evidence that you know the hydroxychloroquine does reduce the viral load, viral viral proliferation, and therefore thereby viral load. So this has been quite fairly well accepted, and uh, uh, which is why in areas like where suppose someone is there in London today, gets the symptoms, it's mm -hmm. better to start off with a. Uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, there is a dose schedule as well. And also, if he's getting a little more positive COVID-19, add on with azithromycin, which is an antibiotics. The combination of anti-malarial antibiotics actually uh, does work to good extent. So when people get into intensive care, very sick, and people have been using other antiviral medications, IL-6 receptor antagonists, you know, there are a lot of things being used. They are more on the compassionate grounds. They've been your retroviral medications and those things. But definitely, and we have come to that stage yet. And even healthcare workers, we are not recommending. A lot of our doctors today, we did a meeting. So should I start a prophylaxis doctor, uh, sir? What do I see? Because I'm seeing a lot of uh, children with well, see, they, you don't, as long as you don't have symptoms, why do you worry about it? The moment you have a symptoms, like a flu like symptoms, let us know. Then we can start it. So that's wrong because uh, malarial medicine is fairly safe, pretty safe, and um, azithromycin is not that uh, uh, that uh, you know uh, dangerous medication. which is an antibiotic, which we all take azithromycin. So this is something which is uh, uh, on the board, but at the same time, we are not actively recommending uh, public or friends or even for our own colleagues, healthcare workers at the moment. Maybe we, say, okay, we start seeing more and more, if you get into the state of like other European countries, we will definitely start looking at it. There's another question here. I believe there is a rumor on WhatsApp. It says that if you can breathe and stop for more than 45 seconds, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly yeah, there are few things like uh, will help. If, even, if, even if we are not doing earlier, uh, the open up our lungs is better. So doing yoga is great now. Uh, doing a bit of run is great because it opens up our lung. So you see, it's a clear any viral infections. If in a viral, even if you got a cold, if you go for a run or if you do yoga, you feel better an hour later. Because we are clearing all the secretions there by the viral load as well. There are a lot of other things people are saying that alkalize, alkalize your uh, whatever you're drinking in the morning, brush your teeth and have some lemon and uh, hot water and drink it. So I think uh, I, there's no great science in that, but uh, there's a common sense in it. it. It would help, it won't do any harm. So these are all things uh, which definitely can be yoga, but, but, but. <laughs> But what not you're saying is holding 45 seconds uh, breath is not the COVID test. It's not that. COVID test. It's a healthy, healthy symptom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I personal lung state. <laughs> yeah. I have one interesting, I, I know this has been going on in my mind. You know, anyone I speak to, they say it's like a flu like thing, you know, nothing to be worried seriously. But many people are dying. How does this happen? I mean, what happens is this virus alone does not kill, isn't it? Is this uh, what exactly is happening to a patient who is going to in that direction? Of course, he got the wrong type of uh, virus, as far as I could, uh, you know, based on Gopi, what he said. There are different variants of virus, and some variants are fatal. What's happening there in those cases? Uh, either, uh, Sorry. Uh, basically, you have to say that influenza also kills 
uh, on an annual basis a certain percentage of people. Uh, so it's not so much only this is killing and the rest of the viruses are not. Uh, it's only that one, it has become a pandemic in a very short time. Two, we don't have enough um, understanding about how to combat it, and it's going to take some time for it to, uh, for for uh, uh, medical fraternity or the research to come up with some recommendation. Uh, the only worry is definitely it is worse than SARS uh, from 2003 to now. Um, it's causing much more serious illnesses, and there is certain uh, a virulence issue, which one is uh, much more uh, uh, dangerous than other viruses. is difficult to um, understand right now. Uh, but the, the rapidity with which it crossed uh, countries' boundaries uh, going across all sorts of uh, countries is what is the real worry. Uh, and that means that we are not uh, equipped enough, fast enough to combat it. And that's the, the I believe that's the real uh, danger rather than the virus itself being very dangerous and killing uh, like, pl uh, like plague killed uh, uh, around the last century, that kind of thing. Ramesh. Yeah, there is a two uh, scientific reasons why uh, people are dying. So one is definitely, you know, when it comes when you say about pathophysiology, how this virus uh, um, progresses, uh, disease, uh, the disease progress because of virus. This actually uh, damages uh, the lung uh, pretty fairly rapidly and is making the lung very stiff. So the normally viral pneumonias, we see a lot of viral pneumonias. Uh, we, know we, we have ventilated a number of children, uh, where adults also uh, ventilated for swine flu. The swine flu did not cause so much of stiff lungness. And uh, when you take care of them, when you start ventilating them, it may be four days, five days, six days, eventually it ease off and then slowly kind of uh, you wean the ventilator settings next day. Here, what actually we've been uh, hearing from the people is once uh, they go into the ARDS, which means white out lungs, lungs becomes very stiff, then mm -hmm. the ventilatory requirements are really going up. We are not able to ventilate them and they're becoming hypoxemic and dying. So the for people going on to the ventilator, getting into the ARDS and then succumbing in this fairly shorter period, that's what actually uh, that's why it is an aggressive one compared to the the swine flu H1 N1. So that's which is one of the reasons there is a higher mortality. Going on ventilator, many 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 people go on ventilators for the pneumonias, viral pneumonias, bacterial pneumonias. I mean, we don't worry about. When I mean, we counsel them, most of them, okay, don't worry about it. Four, five days, six days, you will, we can wean him off. Once uh, this is uh, will get settled, we'll wean him off. Here, the progress is fairly rapid. Also, lungs are getting, getting really stiff to ventilate. And also, at the same time, there are too many of such things are coming. So they are running out of the ventilator, they're running out of the personnel, they're in, you know, actually the dilution of the expertise and those things are happening. This probably, you know, maybe an added fact to that. Um, which is why probably you know, we are seeing more. No, yeah. somebody said there is another question, uh, Ramesh. Yeah. Go ahead. Please. Yeah, can you hear me, uh, Ramesh? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, There's one question. What would be the thresholds or the number of infected people in India before mm -hmm. we give up on these measures? Uh, uh, where's the tipping point? Yeah. Or should we be speculating on that? No, no, no. What his question is, I think, I mean, is is he's asking in a different way. What he meant is that uh, when do we when do we need to stop what we are doing? Lockdowns, um, etc. Yeah. Oh, uh, first of all, you know, obviously the uh, question is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, these uh, de-escalation of the uh, curfew, yeah, yeah. lockdown, and all those things. 
Oh yeah, yes. sure. I mean, it, it, so for instance, um, uh, in two months' time, when uh, China stopped seeing uh, escalation of new cases, they started uh, de-escalating. And now, yesterday, there is a, a sudden uh, reporting of new cases again. So while you have to make sure that there need to be a decreasing number of new reports and new cases and new deaths, which also indicates uh, in a way that whatever the health facilities that we have will be able to manage those reducing number of uh, cases coming into the uh, organizations health organizations that could be one of the ways to reduce the uh, the vigilance and and so called uh, uh, border shutdowns uh, but you cannot you can i don't think you can ever be able to rid, uh, uh, drop your guard until such time you either have a, a viable uh, treatment option or you have vaccine developed, which may be uh, anywhere between 12 to 18 months, but treatment could be available you know, within as much as uh, three to six months, because there are already some trials going on. As Ramesh pointed out, uh, you have uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is being uh, given, and there are observational studies, which uh, shows at least uh, uh, some promise uh, certainly it accumulates in the lungs and reduces the uh, incidence of uh, serious complications and if there are proven cases they are giving uh, chloroquine plus azithromycin so uh, and also two antiviral drugs so if you don't have a viable treatment and if you don't have a vaccine i'm not sure whether you can entirely drop your guard uh, until such time that you have a manageable number of cases Ramesh. Let's put it this way. In the, in a, one is number one is uh, until now, even today, they were saying the private labs are are going to be done last four days. Still, private labs labs are not taken up. Still, we are only testing uh, very very conservatively. Uh, so the lockdown really. Suppose if we do the tests, private labs are doing a uh, actively test now. Automatically, once the private labs are doing. They do number of tests. Everyone goes and get the test done. So we will know at least the uh, prevalence of uh, prevalence uh, uh, or uh, the day-to-day uh, -to -day, the increase in number of uh, uh, the cases. Suppose you know, if we have about um, um, you know, the hundred thousand patients, which are confirmed COVID cases, we can't take whole country. For example, Mumbai, that's where the seems to be more uh, aggressive now. In Mumbai, they, there are about 30, 40,000 patients, and still ICUs are not being kind of, a, not many people are requiring a, a serious treatment, and uh, not many people are developing ARDS. That means that, you know, yes, it is a, we have a virus which is there very much prevalent in the public. It's not causing it much, much seriousness. So, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, otherwise, uh, if there are a lot more are there, and slowly next by next week, we start seeing that the people are kind of knocking the doors of hospitals and ICUs, and we are going through the way of America and UK and uh, different countries, then it's a serious worry. We need to continue to do the lockdown as long as possible. Perhaps we need to we may have to uh, put down a lot more serious efforts uh, in terms of working down. That's why it all depends on the how our vulnerability to the uh, kind of uh, uh, the serious complications versus uh, number of cases. Number of cases are going to definitely rise. We are all we are only trying to see that not to get that high peak. Our medical uh, facility is only at, at one level. If we get a very higher peak, that um, you know that whole lot is going to be a huge load, which impossible to cope, and we will have a huge mortality. So this is something which we don't know yet. We will have to see next one week, ten days, which is why locking down till thirty first is probably absolutely essential. If necessary, a week longer for till 7th, 8th of March, uh, probably makes sense. In 15 days time, we will have a better assessment of the situation. Week 15 days are the very, very important uh, days for us in the, as a, the country.
there is another question about homeo medicine um, i believe there is a uh, one uh, thing called aseni aseni kam um, so the I I think think which is uh, could be useful what's uh, take on it uh, i'll tell you the the we have a various uh, modalities treatments homeo salopathy is uh, unani and those things things which contains uh, heavy metals are always dangerous at any time to anybody i think that one has to be a, one cannot be ignorant of it so which is why a lot of times somebody says that we are taking ayurveda which plant based ayurvedic as a medical community we don't really uh, take a serious note of it when somebody is taking that you know medicines which contains heavy metals and it's a serious worry see the basically what happens is that uh, with alternative medicines uh, there's a lot of faith that goes on um, you, for for a science and non science the difference is that you have a proven case you use certain type of measure either homeo or allopathy or whatever it is and then you measure the effect of that after giving that uh, intervention now in homeopathy there's a lot of psychological benefit there is a lot of individual um, felt uh, confidence that homeopathy is working so unless homeopathy also adopts that you test a person who is a positive for uh, covid-19 and they are willing to take your homeopathy medicine and then afterwards either they get better afterwards you you retest it and they become negative by all means such a very good treatment it doesn't have to be uh, just a, a feeling as long as it is feeling which uh, i believe uh, we have no scientific basis to recommend to somebody um but on the other hand if people are willing to take on the basis of belief that's well and good got it gopi one more uh, question i know uh, the, you've got to rush now um yeah. but uh, maybe a one or two uh, try to address before you go um do you have an idea on in terms of how many beds are available which can treat covid patients in hyderabad for example and uh, uh, yeah okay currently uh, the government mandated uh, gandhi hospital uh, as a nodal center and there is a nodal officer uh, mr prabhakar who is uh, spearheading the activity they have also requested all of us private hospital uh, uh, um, uh, management to set aside 10 icu beds per hospital and perhaps more for much larger hospitals uh, uh, so it could be as high as uh, 200 beds in private hospitals or even more because there are easily 20 uh, 25 big hospitals who can take care of these patients who have ventilators as well taking it to the fact that not all positive patients who needs hospitalization go on to the ventilators they just uh, need some oxygen and support therapy until such time they get out so uh, there may be easily uh, easily 2 to 300 beds uh, available in in hyderabad but not all of them are commanded at this point although they are ready to go at moments notice there are ventilators available uh, for all the beds no but certainly we have equipment we have uh, uh, people but not all the personal protection uh, ppes what's called personal protection equipment they are all in short supply right now we are trying to uh, accumulate those things uh, ramesh and me were talking about it this morning or yesterday morning if you have one patient on the ventilator and if you calculate say six people uh, to be taken care of that patient um, uh, then you need for, for three shifts something like uh, 30 40 personnel uh, protection equipment per day so if the patient is in the hospital for say 7 to 10 days you are running out of uh, ppes in the range of 3 300 350 per patient 
So I don't think any country, including India, is geared up for that kind of demand or pressure on the resources. So just having beds is not enough. You need to have personnel, equipment, uh, material that is necessary, which is disposable material, uh, and also taking care of those people. If they're uh, taking care of the patient who's sick, they may not be able to step out of the hospital, so they may need food, accommodation, sleep, their own clothes getting washed, and all those issues. So it's a logistic nightmare if you want to take care of these patients. But we are, with the help of the committee in the hospital, each hospital, we are trying to organize and gear up ourselves for at least a few patients at any given time uh, to help the, uh, the overall society. Ramesh. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it is. A it's a draining situation actually and, and in terms of personal so we think when compared to other cities i think hyderabad is probably one of the better places because uh, number of icu beds modern hospitals hyderabad definitely scores a lot more than other cities uh, even intensive care personnel but the resources other resources so disposables and uh, the tools the in a normal icu you don't need so many people when you have this kind of situations, you need uh, almost uh, uh, two and a half times more than uh, uh, number of nurses and paramedics required for a given situation, which is why even if you have got a thousand beds, you will you will you will be able to make a capacity beds only five hundred. Yeah. Are there any other testing methods? And right now, we are only um, sample check is only temperature sensor uh, in the facilities before we are allow anyone. Oh, are there yeah. anything else? That, uh, so, like, do? you know, you can only go by the history. Uh, that's why you need to divide them into three: uh, potentials, suspects, and actual disease. So, potentials are those uh, who are in contact or uh, international travel coming from other places or anybody in the family has a, uh, has a proven disease, uh, then you become potential. So it's better if you, uh, even without proof, you better uh, uh, social distance yourself and self-quarantine for 14 days. Um, or people coming from abroad, like uh, my son-in-law came about 20, uh, 10 days ago. Uh, he self-quarantined uh, in Bangalore. So uh, similar things will happen to everybody. Uh, suspects are those who have symptoms like uh, cough, cold, respiratory tract, uh, uh, runny nose, and that kind of thing. With fever, and some people have headache, those are suspects and they need to be tested. And currently in Hyderabad, there is only uh, Gandhi Hospital, but uh, there is a WhatsApp message circulating with a lot of other hospitals' names, but they're not ready as yet. Even today, midday, I checked, and the Apollo Hospital has two names. Uh, SLR diagnostic. They're all possible centers for testing eventually, maybe tomorrow, day after, as and when they uh, uh, up their lab's capacity to do these tests. Now, it cannot be uh, a universal testing. There are two types of tests antibody test and then uh, PCR test. PCR test is very expensive and very few kits are available. So, antibody tests are being done right now at Gandhi. Only highly suspected patients are being tested right now. Uh, but as the capacity builds, certainly more and more people will go and get, them, get themselves checked, uh, by, even by paying. Uh, so the, um, in our hospitals, as you said, there's only an infrared gun to check the, check the temperature uh, and also a history of contact, uh, their own symptoms. These are the only things that we can um, do right now to isolate probables from suspects, and then suspects can get uh, uh, shifted to the place where we can get the test done. And another right. question is, uh, what is stage two, three, and four? I mean, we are seeing in the newspaper, social media. Uh, yeah. What are Ramesh, these? Can you, different can you address that? Um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, Yeah, that's okay, changed. Gopi, you get going. Yes. Yeah, yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sorry. Gentlemen and ladies, please do appreciate Dr. Gopi, um, Padmashree, awardee winner, and yeah, also a very busy man. 
uh, he has performed thousands of surgeries and uh, thousands of surgeries free of cost as well. And in the same thank spirit, you. Gopi, thanks. That's up to you thank for you what, what all you have uh, done. Our Dr. Chandana Reddy is actually online. She can uh, join a, us. I mean, yeah, she if is there are any uh, questions. On, uh, she's a pulmonologist, so she can answer any technical questions. Uh, uh, my office, uh, um, Shirisha, can you uh, make her the panelist? Then she can get a video and uh, answer the questions. Thank you, Gopi. Yeah. Well, so Ramesh Garo, yeah. So stage, stage two, three, stage and one four. is just kind of a, an imported one, and uh, the stage two as a once you start uh, uh, the close contact of the person who has come from elsewhere started developing the as a secondary the secondary people they are stage two once this is well established when uh into the community spread of uh, which is a uh, uh, you know, two steps third step fourth step then which means each person is going to infect two and a half persons so when it comes starts multiplying it is definitely obviously we know that it's going to be a well over spread that's a stage three now the stage four is uh, completely uh, almost you have become at the center so now now we are in the stage stage probably st we are in the stage two definitely and uh, something like uh, kind of uh, uk is on stage three the the uh, spain and italy are in stage four so they they become almost like a because there's so much of caseload, and also uh, in the stage four, you see all the complications and deaths, and those things happen. There is one more question on uh, welcome, Chandanarati Garu. We'll come to you. We have a lot of questions for you. Uh, they, uh, Hello, Dr. Chandana, the how are you? Uh, we are not yeah. able to hear you, Chandanagar. Uh, you may have to switch on the microphone. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, but it's also a very low voice. If you can, uh, yeah, it can be a little louder. Oh, yes, yeah. This is this is good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Now. Yeah, we can Thank hear you. you. Thank now. you. This uh, Sorry, there is a question on. There is a question from uh, about food. There are some rumors about food spreading virus. Um, I mean, coronavirus uh, in, in terms of non veg eating, etc. Well, I think as long as the non vegetarian can be cooked well, there is no risk of uh, transmission of the virus. As long as it's cooked well and uh, eaten, as long as it's not eaten raw, so no danger of uh, transmission through non vegetarian food. Got it. Hello. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Dr. Chandana. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know we understand. Okay, cook well and eat. You got the message. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. Um, so and and there is no risk of uh, as long as you do that. Yeah. So Dr. Chandana, I mean you you are a specialist on you know pulmonology and uh, this virus is attacking the the, the lungs. Yes. Yeah. So it and uh, as I can see that you know at the earlier stages that you detected the best it is. So can you give the audience? I mean we have close to thousand people here. <laughs> Can you give the audience some advice in terms of that they can do at home to see whether their lungs are all right or not, or any to, to check if there are any symptoms? Yeah. No, the symptoms will be like you have a cold, you have a cough, you have a sore throat, and then you have a breathing difficulty. So you need to get yourself examined first because if your uh, initial symptoms can be a common flu also, but you have the history of travel or contact with somebody in the family who was exposed to coronavirus, then you need to be more worried. And then you need to definitely go to a center where you can get yourself tested. But if you don't have any history of contact with the truck, or if you don't have any person you've exposed to, then no need to worry. You just take it as a common uh, cold. And you continue to take symptomatic measures in terms of steam inhalation or antipyretics like paracetamol, and then control your symptoms. And uh, only if you go, go to a stage where you're doing breathless, or you have underlying uh, disorders like you have a cardiovascular disorder, you have a heart problem or a kidney problem, you're a diabetic. Then a pneumonia, simple pneumonia also can become bad in your situation. So there, then you again need to go to the doctor. But if you have only upper respiratory symptoms 
and you don't have any history of travel and you don't have any history of any contact with a person uh, who has traveled abroad or in India, then you don't need to worry. Just take symptomatic measures and in four to five days, you should be all right. But if you have a background comorbid illness like any diabetes or anything, or if you have bursting breathlessness, which is a very important symptom, which is indicates that you are going to the lungs now, then you need to definitely consult a doctor and get treated. Even if it's a simple pneumonia, not corona, I mean, it could be simple pneumonia or some other cause of the pneumonia could be there, which leads to antibiotics and appropriate treatment. So, as long as confirmed to upper respiratory, you can, you can wait at home. Once it goes to a lower respiratory and you feel breathless, then definitely you need to contact a doctor and come to a center to get investigated. Understood. So, when you say upper respiratory, what you meant by is the cold? Only, only cold, cold, something, cold, something on the. Cold. Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> healthy people, upper respiratory need not bother about it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, people with complications or elderly people, even uh, simple pneumonia could be dangerous. So, then anyway, need to go to a hospital. Yeah, they need to go to a hospital. Ir irrespective of their corona or not. Yeah, corona or yeah. not corona. In treatment. Got it. Got it. <laughs> So, uh, so far, your your advice to people, Chandna Redigar, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, what, uh, of course, the social distancing, etc., we've seen, but what are your observations? Any other message that you think would be useful for? Uh, I think, like they said, cough etiquette is one thing, cough etiquette, because you need to really cover your face and mouth when you're coughing, even if you have a simple viral also. So that is one. Second is surface cleaning, like especially in the hospital situation or workplace, site of workplace. So continuous uh, surface cleaning of the surrounding tables, chairs, and what you're using the instruments. Everything should be cleaned properly, regular, regular intervals. And then social distancing. These are the three things I would uh, recommend this point. I think social distancing is the most important, uh, especially with regard to corona. It is the most important thing because you isolate yourself for two weeks and then the, you don't transmit the virus or you don't get it from somebody else. So that's the best thing I think is the can do for yourself and for your family. Thank you, thank you, Chandra. Yeah, the uh, I mean, we have taken uh, some measures in at our company. Uh, Ninety-five percent of our people, we have bought laptops and sent them home, and uh, yeah. they're all working from home. About five percent essential people staff. Um, we at stage three, our end of stage three, beginning of stage four, we decided to. Uh, put them inside a data center itself. So we have made all arrangements to for them to stay, eat, you know, relax, yeah, play games. The the whole arrangements have been made so that they self quarantine themselves and uh, for a few weeks, and then the next batch takes over. So, so these are some of the uh, measures that we have been taking. And as far as uh, my personally, my parents, um, we are a big family of four sisters and their kids and you know it's a the whole family itself is close to 100 people immediate family so we have uh, what we have decided is that uh, our uh, my parents live with me so i moved out and we quarantine them along with just one uh, person to take care of them and uh, including the newspapers which go there lie there for a day before they touch it yeah so these are some of the measures that uh, we've been taking to safeguard, uh, you know, elderly people. Are there anything that you would, uh, Ramesh, this question applies to you also, that you yeah. would recommend uh, people to uh, do with their family members and with respect to their office lives? Last couple of minutes, um, Ramesh, I know you have to rush. We intended this uh, webinar to be kept for a very uh, one hour, but it is kind of a uh, stretching to a lot more. Uh, Ramesh is frozen. Uh, Chandanagar, you could continue. I think maybe, like, the most important, I would say, people around everybody, is pop, uh, they should follow hand hygiene. I think hand hygiene will help a lot. So, repeated washing of the hands, even if you are not in contact with a person who is uh, infected, constantly wash your hands and uh, uh, keep uh, if you are exposed at home, especially if you're not going out, okay, you don't need a mask. But if you're going out, please uh, wear a mask and go. And uh, constantly wash your hands and don't keep touching your face with your uh, hands. These three basic things. And the people in the working in the house or who are uh, being there constantly repeated education. I think they keep on telling them the same thing again and again. 
so that they keep following it because we tend to become lax after four three days of doing it we tend to become a little lax so i think we should uh, repeatedly keep on informing them the same thing and educating the people around us constantly about how to follow hand hygiene how to social distance and then uh, how to wear a mask and uh, keep it properly if you're going out to the house thank you thank you very much even the work uh, ramesh, uh, i think ramesh you are on mute um, but um, uh, we really appreciate uh, um your time and uh, chandra garu we really appreciate your time um for helping our community um there on behalf of thai hyderabad um we thank you all of you for you know, you know you know spending your time valuable time and uh, uh you know answering all the questions of the uh, people who have attended here thank you very much thank you sridhar uh, thanks for bringing the top doctors in the city uh, to talk to us about uh, the most important topic uh, it's a very well attended uh, session uh, we had 1121 registrations and close to 842 people could log in uh, during the last one hour or more uh, listening to our doctors uh, uh, gopichan vanam garu and uh, ramesh panchal garu Uh, and thank you dr chandra reddy uh, for joining in uh, uh, and giving us your valuable insights uh, thanks reader and thanks everybody uh, who participated and attended this session uh, we love you all uh, we keep bringing uh, more and more topics uh, relevant to the entrepreneurial community uh, regarding this uh, uncertainty and also the lockdown that we are all going thank you so much uh, good evening to all thank you good evening Right. Thank you, Fani and your team for putting this together in just one day, 24 hours notice. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Please convey my regards to the whole staff. Yeah. Thanks, Sridhar. Thanks so much. Uh, Bye. 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 Bye.